I want you to open your Bible with me, not to Romans 6 yet, but I want you to go to the book of 1 Corinthians. And I'm not going to give you the chapter, chapter yet, because I want to start with asking you a question. If somebody were to walk up to you today and ask you, where in the world, inside the Bible, does it say that the gospel saves souls? Where would you take them? If somebody were to ask you cold turkey today on the street, they would walk up to you and say, show me in the Bible where the gospel says it saves souls. Where would you take them? What verse would you use? I heard Romans. Well, yeah, eventually Romans 6 is going to be probably a pretty good, pretty good passage. But that's not the best passage. What would be the best passage to answer that question? You bet it's in First Corinthians. You know it. I tried to help you a little bit. You got it. Mary's got it. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Did you see my notes ahead of time? Or? No. That's awesome. It's, uh, and I wouldn't even go all the way to verse 8. I'd pull up at verse 6. But hey, verse 8 just gives you more context, right? So let's go there this morning because this is where I want to start. And um, I believe I got it for the screen, too. So we'll throw it up on the screen if you want to follow along. Maybe I don't. I can't remember if I did or not. Um, I stayed out partying too late last night. And uh, this morning, my brain's functioning on about negative 17 degree weather, if you know what that means. Um, But uh, remind me, Mary, I got some candy up front here for you. So good job on that one. All right. Check it out here. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 6, it says this. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. Why don't we respond to read this? You can do that. How about you take verse 2? Let's do the evens for you. By which you were being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. So the gospel was doing what? In which you're being... Huh. There it is right there in clear color. Uh, I guess it's like the absence of color since it's white, but in your Bible. Verse 3, for I delivered to you first of first importance what also I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to, well, who's Cephas? Peter, Peter, right? He he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. I'm glad you haven't fallen asleep yet this morning, so you're still awake to to get this truth. Um, But falling asleep there means that they have died, obviously, and there was 500 brothers who saw Jesus Christ at one time. At the time of the writing of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is saying some of these people are still alive, and they are testifying the fact that this saying is true. But now I want to back up to the slide before this one and look at what verse 2 says or verses 3 and 4 actually had to say. Uh, Sorry, Mark, I misled you there. But it says this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, according to the scriptures, and that he was what? And that he, according to the scriptures, the death, the burial, the resurrection. By the way, now let's jump back to the slide uh, that shows verse 2 there, Mark. Now, look at what it says. I'd remind you, brothers, of the what? Gospel Gospel I preach to you, which you received and which you stand, by which, what? The gospel you are? So right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, 1 through 8. How about you can take the whole chapter for that much. It is summarizing this idea that the gospel is what saves mankind. Now let me ask you a question. What doctrine is missing in this passage? Where's baptism? Where is it at? If this is what saves you, why did Paul, who, by the way, who wrote the book of Romans? Paul. Why would Paul leave out a quintessential part of salvation in a summary statement like this? I mean, he's, listen, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did did Paul just like have a Freudian moment here and forget to stick baptism in the scriptures? 
Baptism's not part of salvation. Baptism is a outward sign of an inward change that goes along with your starting of your public ministry and public testifying of Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Look no further than Jesus himself. He who didn't know sin, he who didn't have the ability to sin, was baptized. Immediately after baptism, he goes out into the wilderness to be what? Tempted. He was in all points tempted like we are, yet he still didn't sin. And then immediately after he leaves the temptation, he's victorious there, the angels come and minister to him, and then what does Jesus begin? His ministry. His public earthly ministry. And baptism for the Christian is simply a public declaration that you're going to start your earthly ministry for Jesus Christ. And what are the odds that because you do it in a church, who is going to keep you accountable for working out your own ministry for Jesus Christ. Who would hold you accountable in the church? The people, right? So why do we baptize inside of churches today in our modern time? Why don't we drag you out to the Sauk Lake today, take a chainsaw, cut a big hole in the ice, and jump in and, and submerge you underwater, like the word means? Why don't we do that today? You guys are wimps. That's why we don't do it. You gotta have a heated baptismal for crying out loud. You guys are wimps. It's a cultural thing. The reality is we could do that today, couldn't we? And why don't we baptize people in private? Why do we do it in a service? Do you realize you got them in the water with us? That'd be awesome. <laughs> I would never feel more alive than baptizing somebody in ice cold water. I would remember, actually, one of the coldest baptisms I ever did was in Kansas. And it was actually in the church. And over, we, they filled the baptismal, turned the heater on, and it never turned on. And we didn't know it was really that cold until we actually got in the water. And let me tell you what, it is hard to hide that fact. <laughs> We're, we didn't hide it at all well. And it was cold. And I remember that one clear as day, I can tell you that. So... Uh, I might need a Minnesota ice baptismal just to rival that one. Um, <laughs> I still remember who it was even. So, but you know what? Baptism is that outward sign that you associate with the gospel. And what is the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection. So when we baptize somebody, we do it in water. We place them under water. We bring them back out of the water to symbolize the death being put in the, in the grave and the resurrection that comes with newness of life. And that's why we say, and walk in newness of life. Not because their sins are forgiven. They already were forgiven. But this is the chance for them to walk in a public way different than what they did before. Romans 6 is that transition chapter telling you where you were and what you are. And it's, it's talking about this messy process in our minds, not in God's mind. God's mind is crystal clear how this works. But in our minds, we struggle. And then we're going to see in chapter 7 the ultimate struggle of man with his own thoughts and his own actions and, and the war that happens within mankind, even today, pictured in Paul. We're going to see that struggle really in in high definition. So today we're going to watch in like standard definition TV kind of remember those big boxes that had tubes and like some of you actually had to get off the couch to change the channel by hitting a little heat sensor button or turning a knob. Do you remember those days? And, and like a 17 inch TV was like massive. Remember those days? Like not your cell phone. So we're going to look at Romans 6 because that's kind of what it's like. We got to go back in time to a time in which you first got saved. And as we go back in time here, I'm going to help you to understand what Jesus Christ has done for you through the gospel that he proclaims in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. So let's go over to Romans 6 now. And, and as we're turning over there, I, want to, I just want to state this. If you have believed in Jesus Christ, that he has died for you, and that your sins was the reason that he was put on the cross, 
then the gospel of Jesus Christ is not something that we compartmentalize and put away, but it is the very essence and the very motivation for why we serve Jesus Christ today. Because when we truly take in what God has done for us, the motivation then is to do what? To share it. If you got some good news today, the best news, let's say whatever, think about what would be the best news that you could hear today. Get that in your mind right now, okay? And let's say that by the end of the service today, you get a text message that tells you that the greatest thing that could happen to you today happened. Would you tell somebody? You would, right? Especially if it was monetary gain or, or capital gain or, or something like that, something that is very rewarding. You wouldn't hesitate to share that good news with anyone who would listen to you. And when we truly get the gospel, when we truly inter- internalize what Jesus Christ has done for us, and we realize how free we've been set, we won't help but let other people know the good news. Why is the gospel called the good news? You know what the bad news is? If you die apart from Christ, you're going to hell. That's sad. And you know what? Every week we open the newspaper, and what do we see in the newspaper? Obituaries. Those people have no chance. Their time is done, and and the decision they made has been made, and there's no recompense for physical death. Because remember, what do dead people do? They're dead. What do spiritually dead people do? Well, let's look and see what the Bible says here in in Romans chapter 6. We're going to pick up the narrative at verse 8. Remember, last week we started with this idea of, of being baptized. And what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Let it never be said among us. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Remember, we were asking these questions last Sunday as we studied this. Well, we're going to pick up the narrative now in verse 8, and it's piggybacking. Remember, we're building an argument here. We're building a case for Jesus Christ and for salvation. And it says this, Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with who? With Christ. For we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. I mean, how many times did Jesus have to die for sin? Once, right? So if he will never die again, then death no longer has, this is a bad word in America today, right? Death will no longer have dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Okay? So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now that sounds simple enough, right? So consider yourself dead to sin and alive to Jesus. And if the chapter ended right there, that would be a great thing for us, wouldn't it? Well, you just like, all right, chapter 7, let's go. The problem is what happens in the very next verse. Let not sin reign. What? If I'm considered dead to sin, why would Jesus tell me don't let sin reign if I'm no longer captivated by sin? Oh, there must be two different things going on in our text here. It can't just be one thing going on. There's got to be two different things going on here. And it has been happening and we just haven't realized it because we're compartmentalizing this text a little bit. But remember, this is a building argument. Just as you're no longer dead, just as you should no longer keep on sinning, that grace may abound, don't let that be ever said among Christians that we have that mindset. But instead, I want you to make sure that you don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. So don't present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Now, 
I'm going to be straight honest with you, okay? I could preach three, work, three weeks worth of sermons on the first verse of this text, okay? Um, on the very first verse of the text, let alone the ones that come after. So my goal today is not to exhaustively exegete everything out of this passage, but it's to give you an overview. So if you want to go back and study this out yourself, you can. But I'm going to help you fill in the little cliff notes, if you will. How many remember cliff notes? Those of you who are like younger than me don't have, well, maybe, all right, if you're under 30, you have no idea what cliff notes are, right? It's called Google now. <laughs> cliff notes, we actually had to read a book about a book so we could report on the book, right? Now you just Google and it tells you what, it, what happened. So I'm going to give you the cliff notes. I'm going to give you the cheat notes, if you will, of how to study this passage of scripture to where not only does it make sense, but it also is possible to live. And would God ever ask us to do something that it's impossible for us to do? Would he ever command us and give us a command that would leave us in absolute despair without giving us a way to fulfill it? No. So why would God leave us in a dichotomy of saying, consider yourself dead to sin, but as you sin, don't let it reign in your life? Oh, it's hard to understand, isn't it? It's hard, to, it's hard to figure out why God would give both commands. I mean, is God, God's not schizophrenic, right? So it can't be that. God's not double-minded, so it can't be that. So what is God actually trying to get across to us through the writings of Paul here? Well, let's dive into this. Let's dig in and let's actually exegete this out and study it out so that we can be approved workmen unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but able to rightly divide the word of truth, right? Uh, Katrina sung about truth. We sang about the truth of God and the nature of God and his character. And we know that scripture does tell us what the truth is. So let's unlock the truth this morning as we get in because it is very easy for us to say this phrase. Jesus died on the cross for my sin and because he died on the cross for my sin, I no longer am bound by sin, right? The problem is, how long do you live that way? If we're honest, how much do we live that way? Turn the TV on, you see a commercial and your thought like, there goes that. You walk into a, a, a room and there's a fishing buddy and, hey, how was the fishing? It was amazing. I caught the biggest fish I ever caught. Did you really? Well, maybe it's a white lie. White lies are good, aren't they? Those are, those are acceptable to God. It's like the stop sign with the white stripe around the outside. Those are optional, aren't they? The solid red ones mean stop. The ones with the white mean optional. No. Anybody in driver's ed? No. They all mean stop, okay? So when we look at this, we've got to understand there's more going on in the narrative than we see on the surface. Remember, we asked the question a couple of weeks ago, who or what is reigning in your life? Remember that? Who or what? If it's sin then stop. If it's Jesus Christ, then run with it, right? Go with him. Surrender. Give up. Give up being an enemy combatant against God. Fully surrender your weapons. Fully surrender your will. Fully surrender your desires to Jesus Christ and be adopted into his family. That's salvation. But what we're talking about right here, what he's talking about here is he is beginning to slice, if you will, the hair in such fine threads that he's actually showing you what's really going on in your life. When he says, I've saved you spiritually, you're being saved physically, and one day you're going to be saved ultimately in a different way. So remember I said a few weeks ago, salvation is not past tense, it's not present tense, and it's not future. It's all of them, isn't it? How many of you have been saved? How many of you are being saved today? And how many are looking forward to the blessed hope where one day we shed this body and we're with Jesus Christ? Right? Guess what? Same word, all three places. Hmm. So being saved isn't just a one-time act that happens in the past. It is an ongoing, continual thing that's being done on behalf of every single Christian alive today. And that's exactly what Romans 6 is teaching. Let's look at it in depth now. Let's dig into the passage here. And then we're going to pull in some other passages of Scripture that are going to help re-solidify this. And really, for me, the crux of the passage here is Romans chapter 6 
and verse 8. Romans 6 and verse 8. Notice what it says. Now. Okay, what is this built? This is building on the previous thought. Who's reigning in your life? Who's controlling you? You have victory over sin. You're in the family of God. Now, if we have died, to Christ, died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Does Jesus Christ live with you today? That's a trick question. Jesus Christ is not living in your heart today. Where is Jesus Christ today? We sung it in the last congregational. He's sitting on the throne in heaven, hearing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and... Right? Jesus is alive forever. If you doubt that, just go back and read Revelation chapter 4. It's an ongoing thing. Who resides in the Christian today? Who was given as a down payment for Christians today that Jesus Christ would come back? And who is it that after Jesus Christ returns is no longer needed in that capacity to seal Christians until the day that Jesus Christ comes? So it, it fits doctrinally. It makes sense doctrinally. So we as believers today, when we received the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins and we placed ourselves into the family of God by means of Jesus Christ, we now can come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? Because it's not, we're not coming in our standing, in our power, in our might. We're coming through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit works in us and speaks utterance that we're not able to. Let me ask you a question. How many sins have you committed in the past week? Did you confess every one of those sins specifically to God as 1 John 1, 9 commands you to? So then are those sins not forgiven? <laughs> they are forgiven. Why? Why? Because the Holy Spirit speaks on our behalf before God with words in which we cannot utter. It doesn't mean that it's some mysterious heavenly language. It means this. Can you remember every bad thing you've done in the last week? No. So guess who goes to bat for you? Holy Spirit of God. Aren't you glad you have him as representation? By the way, if there's any doubt that that's right, go to Zechariah chapter 3 and watch what happened to the high priest of the nation of Israel, as he stood before God, being accused by Satan, with Jesus Christ as his defense attorney, and God the Father as the, as the judge and jury sitting on the throne, and Satan, Lucifer, is the advocate for accusing the high priest of being disqualified for service because of all the sin that he has in him. And you know what Jesus says? Whoa, time out. That's not a true argument. What is it in court when they say objection, right? Jesus Christ says, Objection. I've given him new clothes, I've given him a new hat, I've given him a new name. He is purified, he's no longer in sin. And Satan says, yeah, but he didn't confess every sin. And Jesus says, he doesn't have to, because the branch of David will come and forgive of all sin. Who knew that was in Zechariah 3? Go check it out, it's all there. The courtroom of God, you can stand in the presence of God, be put on trial by Satan himself. By the way, how do we know that Satan himself does that? Zechariah 3, but how about Job? Who put Job on trial? Satan did. Who was the advocate for Job? Jesus Christ. Who was the judge and jury? God the Father. So not only do we see it in Job's life, not only do we see it in Zechariah chapter 3, where it's talking about Joshua, the high priest. But you know who also does it even today? Who is your advocate before God? It works. It's there. We just got to study and know it. So let's dig into the passage here. Is Jesus Christ alive forever? This is a simple question for, this is like Christianity 101, right? If God isn't everlasting, or Jesus isn't everlasting, then he's not who? I gave away the answer. He's not God, because only God is everlasting. So if Jesus Christ lives forever, how do we know that we too can live forever? Well, Romans 6 and verse 8 says this, if we die with Christ, we will also live with Christ. And the idea and the inference is, how long is that effective? Forever. So let's go to a couple other scriptures to see the same idea. What's significant about this? 
Is Jesus alive forever? John chapter 14 and verse 6. Notice what it says there on the screen. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except... We all know that verse, right? That's an easy one. How about 1 Peter 3.18? For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us... Where? Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive... Ooh, we're getting somewhere now. So when we died spiritually, when we were dead spiritually, which you were before you were saved. Remember Colossians 3? You read it, didn't you? For which you were, remember those things? Liars, malice, slanders, the grocery list of items Colossians threw at you. And then it said, and such were some of, okay, that some of, uh, no, this was who you were before Christ, is what Paul's saying in Colossians 3. He says, just as this was true of you then, this is true of you now. You've been set free from that. You who were dead spiritually are alive spiritually now. And those of you who are alive physically are still going to die. Why? Why? Because we live in a God-forsaken world. We live in a world in which death reigns. Why? Go back to the Garden of Eden. Physical death is going to occur to everybody on the face of the earth, pretty much guaranteed right now, right? Even God himself didn't escape death. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross. God in the flesh, dwelling among us. He who knew no sin. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The righteous for the unrighteous, what did he do for us? He died. Being put to death in the flesh. I love how it makes that little, okay? He was put to death because what does that imply? He was put to death in the flesh, but he was not put to death in the oh. We're getting unlocked. We're starting to unlock it here. So, hang on. Fasten your seatbelts. We've got a little bit further to go. John chapter 20. Let's jump there. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23 is going to give us a little more that we need to unlock this puzzle, okay? On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, what day would that be? Okay, first day of the week. Doors being unlocked. Where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. (laughs) Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you, you think? You're in a room locked, hiding because you're afraid you're going to be put to death by the Romans or by the Jews or by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pretty much everybody mad at Jesus is now mad at you. And they're hiding in the room and uh, it just appears out of nowhere. I mean, you'd be like, hey, Jesus, what's up? No. You know what they did? Ah! Where'd you come from? And Jesus says, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, you think? Oh, good, it's not a ghost. It's Jesus. We know this guy. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. It tells you they're hyperventilating. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had read this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgave the sins of any, then... They are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Interesting passage to read. Interesting passage to study. Talks about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples for the task of going to Acts chapter 2 and starting the church. And the sign that they were indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God was, number one, everyone thought they were drunk. And number two, what came down and descended on them? Cloven tongues of fire. By the way, who descended on Jesus Christ to proclaim his earthly ministry? Holy Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit is being validated, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is being validated in Acts chapter 2 for this event in John chapter 20. And it's saying this, I'm going to empower you in a spiritual way in which you are currently dead. So this is spiritual empowerment. And what we're going to see in Romans 6 here is God is going to take that which is dead and spiritually empower them to do public ministry for Jesus Christ, for the sake of Christ. You weren't saved just to get 
out of hell and into heaven, you were saved to go win the world for Jesus Christ. And Romans 6 is declaring that to you. So, let, let's, 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 can we put, start putting it together now? Or do we need to dig a little deeper? Do we need a little, how about one more scripture? Okay, that wasn't enough. I know three or four scriptures aren't enough, but when God says it once, it's good. God says it twice, it's really good. When God says it about 20 times, take it to the bank, right? This is like absolutely good. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13 through 16. I charge you in the presence of God who gives, say it with me. Who gives it? And Jesus Christ, who is the testimony before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has, who dwells in unapproachable light, in whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him is honor and what? Eternal dominion. Amen. You sung about that in Romans chapter, or Revelation chapter 4, didn't you? The light, the rainbow of light that comes out of the throne room of God, and holy, 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 and all this stuff. And God is an eternal being. Jesus Christ is an eternal being. And what type of body does Jesus Christ have when he's in heaven? You see the nails. You see the side. You see the feet. It's a glorified body that has the scars of the physical torture that he went through. Well, I, I lied to you. I said one more. How about one more still? Because what's better than one more scripture than another scripture, right? How about Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16? We might as well go there. Then he turned and saw the voice that was speaking to me, and turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, and the hairs of his head were white. See, it's spiritual. Like white wool, like snow, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were burnished like bronze, refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. Can anybody associate with those attributes of the body? Do you have hands? Do you have feet? Do you have a face? Jesus has an earthly body. It's a glorified body. But it's a body similar to what we have in, in many ways. And yet it's identifiable with who he is. So we're talking about two different types of life here in, in Romans chapter 6. So here's what I want you to understand. Number one, why would one not want to believe in Jesus Christ? Over and over in scripture... Jesus Christ said what? I'm the only way you can get to the Father. The only reason somebody would not want to surrender to Jesus Christ is because they want to be their own God. They want to control their life. They want to do what they want to do, not what God tells them to do. By the way, who is the God of rebellion? God the Father or Satan himself? So this dichotomy makes sense. Now, let's go back to Romans chapter 6, and I want you to join me at verse 11, because now we're going to tear this thing down, okay? Okay. So Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 14, tells us how we are to live for God. All right? How do we reconcile this being dead but alive and still sinning and yet not bound by sin, but we're sinners and we're set free from sin, but we still sin? How does all this, how does all this stuff happen? So verse 8, if we now have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Okay? How have we died with Christ? What died? Our sin. Because who took your sin? Jesus Christ did. And where did he take it to? The cross. So it says, if we have died with Christ spiritually, he took our sin, he who knew no sin became sin for us, then we believe that we will also live with him. John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There it is. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again, physically or spiritually. Well, it has to be physical. He never died 
spiritually. He, why? He's God. He couldn't die spiritually. So what we have is, imagine two railroad tracks, okay? How many tracks do you need to make a train run? One rail or two? Two, right? Okay? Spiritually speaking, there are two rails to your life. There's the physical rail, and there's the spiritual rail. Up to this point of salvation in your life, your spiritual rail was broken. But your spiritual rail, your physical rail was alive, but your spiritual rail is dead, right? I have a train track in my house, and there's power in both rails. And when one rail loses power, guess what happens to all the engines? They stop working. They're dead. They're rendered inactive. They have all the potential to live, but without power, they have nothing. And you who are alive physically, but dead spiritually, were missing the thing that you needed to live. You were lacking power. So then Jesus comes along, and he takes the sin in your life that's keeping you powerless, and he takes the physical part of you and says, I'm going to die physically on behalf of you so that you no longer have to die spiritually because of you, and I'm going to make you alive. I'm going to turn the power on to the second rail. So now you're still living physically in this world. By the way, have you gotten a new body yet? Not yet. So the old body's still there, right? The struggles of the old body are still there. But now you've gone from having no power to be empowered by God to do what? To haul whatever he wants you to haul, right? Because all you are is a train on the tracks. And God empowers and breathes into you the Holy Spirit of God. And when he breathes into you the Holy Spirit of God, you now become alive to the things that are spiritual that you were once dead to. And now he asks the question back in Romans 6 and verse 1. This question is going to make sense now. Shall we as followers of Christ keep on turning off our power rail so that we can have God's grace abound even more in the world today? Wouldn't that be great? No. What would be greater is that you start hauling the load spiritually because the Holy Spirit's empowered you to do it. God says, I've designed you to do something special. And what makes me most happy, what makes me most proud of my children is when they walk in the things I want them to walk in. So don't live like the world. Quit hauling the world stuff and start hauling my stuff. Stop trying to be like the world and the things of the world because the things of the world die. Why? Because they're physical. But be alive to Christ because it's spiritual. So now, what are some things that we should live for and what should we die to? Verses 11 all the way through 14 give us the recipe. Verse 11 says this, Count yourself dead to sin. Whenever you sense yourself in a sinful situation, tell yourself that sin and death no longer are a thing because we want to live for God. Dead things do nothing. Number two, count ourselves alive to Jesus Christ. Count ourselves alive to Jesus Christ. Exercise this once a day. Take it, the reality, take a deep breath in, and then exhale. And whenever you do this, you realize that the Holy Spirit is living inside of you. Right? Everybody breathe in together. And then exhale. That's what the Holy Spirit did to you spiritually. If somebody was struggling right now with, with living, what's the first thing that a, a rescuer is going to try to do on them when they're incapacitated? CPR, right? What are they trying to do? Keep air moving in and out of the lungs, right? If you keep air moving in and out of the lungs, it equates to what? Life. It equates to life. And God says, I have breathed into you the Holy Spirit of God. You've been empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Number three, don't let sin reign in your body. Verse 12, that has the idea of this. Um... Well, actually, verse 13 tells us how to do that. We don't offer ourselves. We don't leave room for sin. This is talking about intentional sin. We don't intentionally go around sinning. Why? That's the old nature. We've been changed into Jesus Christ. Um, look at verse, the other half of verse 13. Don't use your body as an instrument for sin, but instead use it as an instrument for who? For God. You are dead to yourself. You're alive to Christ. You're dead to your own desires. You're alive to Jesus' desires. 
The light, think of that rail, that power rail. Uh, I have an HO train layout in my basement. Some of you have seen it over at my house. And when the power's on, the trains are fun. All of a sudden, you're driving along and everything shuts off. What's the first thing you think? Where'd my power go? I need power. These things won't work without power. They got all the potential, but without power, they do nothing. My RC airplanes, or even in a real airplane, uh, the, the worst thing that could happen to a pilot is, at the moment of rotation, what stops? You pull back and the engine quits. Guess what? You don't have many options. You can always take airspeed and make altitude. You can always take altitude and make airspeed. But when you're out of two of the three, did you get it? <laughs> There's not three options. <laughs> when you're out of both, you're done. Because without altitude and airspeed, you've got a one trajectory angle to the ground. And the worst place to lose an engine is on takeoff. Look no further than Sully Sullenberger and the miracle on the Hudson. A jet without power is coming down. And a Christian who turns the power off spiritually is a Christian that's looking for a place to crash. That's why God says, be alive unto me. Follow me. So what are your eyes seeing today? What parts of your body are you offering to Jesus Christ? What are your eyes seeing? What are your ears listening to? What, are, what thoughts are in your mind? Where do you take your feet? What are your hands doing for Jesus Christ? But last of all, use our bodies as instruments to God. If God just wanted us to be saved so we can go to heaven and get out of hell or get out of jail free card, if you will, why would he give commands for us to do something with it? The idea of salvation being a past event that is only good for the past is not something that God ever taught in his scripture. You know who taught that? Satan himself. Because if he can render you inactively spiritually for God, what are you going to do for God? So God says this, remember who you are. Remember from whence you came, and remember who's in control. So when you look at verses and I'm going to read them here together with us again. And I want us to read these scriptures together. So Mark, if you can pull them up there. I didn't do this at the end. But I want us to read these verses 11, 12, and 13 again. And I want to hear the commands of what it says. So join me at verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. I belled on the last part so you would hear it. Whose choice is it? Who makes that decision? God made it available, but who has to take it? This is the taking aspect of the gift that God has given to you in salvation. God says, it's effectual for all. You want to get the sovereignty? Here, I'll give, you a I'll give you a snapshot. You want the sovereignty of God, free will, a man issue? Right there it is. God sovereignly has given you everything you need to get saved. Who's it good for? Those that do it. Those that actually take it. That's the whole free will of God, sovereignty of man thing in, in, in a couple verses right there. It's not difficult to understand. What makes it difficult is when we want to add all our little angles into it. But the reality is right here. And if you do what verse 13 says, then what's the result? Sin will not have dominion over you. Why? Because you're under grace. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is... And we're going to build on this, okay? So don't, don't give up. Because remember, what does Romans 6.23 say? For the wage of sin is... But the gift of God is, and how do you get that? Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? So I want you to go back this week. I want you to read Romans 6, 1 through, 1 through 14, and I want you to see who you are 
because of what Jesus Christ has done. And then the end of the chapter is going to tell us this. What can you be for Jesus Christ based on what he's done for you? And then we're going to find out the struggle that there is in sin in Romans chapter 7. And uh, the struggle that's there for mankind. So let's close with a word of prayer and we'll keep building on this week after week. Like I said, I could have preached an entire message in each one of these verses. Um, I don't even know how many verses I took you to outside of this chapter to reinforce what the chapter is saying. Okay, so this is a huge part of understanding Romans is Romans chapter 6. And knowing what Christ has done for us and now what we can do for him because of what he's done for us. So let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that it's quick and powerful. It's knowable. And Father, we can live for you because of what you've done for us. And Lord, I pray that as we study your scriptures, and Lord, even, man, how time flew, just trying to get through this passage, that Father, there is so much truth in your word, so much freedom that can be had in understanding doctrine. And doctrine is not bad. It's not yucky. It's not hard. It's the power. It's the confidence. It's the assuredness that what we know the Bible says is true is going to happen and it's real. And Father, those of us who are Christians, we no longer have to render ourselves under sin. We have victory because the Holy Spirit resides in us today. So the life that we live now, Father, is not turned on so we can do whatever we want and keep on sinning, but it's so that we can sin less and glorify our Father in heaven by doing what you want us to do. It's it's taking the family name and going and living it for God. So Father, help us to do that in the days and weeks ahead. Help us as we study this passage of scripture to know it and to heed it and to preach it and teach it to those around us. The good news that we are dead to sin and alive to God. We who were dead spiritually are now alive and we who once lived for ourselves physically are now living for Christ physically. And that transaction that's taken place has changed us and molded us into the image of Jesus Christ. So, Father, help us to live for you this week. In your name we pray. Amen.